Hello. Hello. As I said the other day, you're really dreaming you got another month of summertime and vacation. You're really at the beach right now. You just don't know it. You'll wake up in a minute. You'll see the water. And you'll be so excited to think that in a month, you'll be here having lunch with friends somehow. Welcome. We're delighted to have everybody here. We are starting today with our best, two of our students, two new students, Gabriella Roberts, um, who is an incoming freshman, and she'll tell you about herself, and then Tim Manohe, who is actually coming as a graduate student, incoming doctoral student. Manohe, yes, Tim, yes. We'll start with Gabriella and then Tim, okay? Give them both a hand right now. <laughs> Hello, and <laughs> thank you for having me here today. As President Hebrowski said, my name is Gabriella Roberts, and I am an incoming freshman at UMBC. I am proud to be part of the Humanities Scholars Program and the Honors College. When I started looking at colleges during my junior year of high school, I had a pretty good idea of what I was looking for. I wanted a larger university that focused on research because I was interested in pre-med. I preferred a university that had as much emphasis on academics as it did athletics, if not more. A good study abroad program was also important Woo! to me, <laughs> <laughs> along with an honors program and other prestigious programs for students and the, abil and the ability to work closely with professors on research or to just get help. Sounds familiar, right? But UMBC wasn't on my radar screen until my dad, who is an alum, <laughs> suggested I take a look. So in August, before my senior year, I visited UMBC and took a tour that, to my surprise, matched my criteria for an ideal school. UMBC gave me great vibes, and I felt as if I belonged here and that the students were my type of people. When Dale Bittinger, came to my high school, the Friends School of Baltimore, I was lucky to get a personal interview with him. Mr. Bittinger's enthusiasm about UMBC and helpful pointers about what programs I should look into encouraged me to visit once again. That time, I visited an honors biology class, and although the class was very large, I saw that by using the clickers and engaging in group work, the students were able to personalize the class. I later met with Dr. Carolyn Forstier, an associate professor of political science, and for an hour, effort, we effortlessly talked about our shared passion for Italy. She emitted so much enthusiasm towards teaching that the thought of having professors like her only made UMBC more attractive. So I knew that UMBC was my kind of place, but I wasn't sure exactly what programs I should apply to. I applied to the honors program because I knew that the advising in smaller classes would make guidance and teaching exactly what I was looking for. Although, sorry, I thought about the Meyerhoff program but realized it wasn't for me. Mr. Bittinger encouraged me to consider the Humanities Scholars Program and I was thrilled to learn about the study abroad requirement and all the cultural activities. It seemed like the perfect fit. Really, I want to have it all at UMBC. I want to excel in both my Humanities Scholar Program and my Pre-Med Program knocking out two majors in history and biological sciences in four years. I want to study in Europe or South America, and though I speak Portuguese fluently, I'm looking to perfect my Spanish. I want to form lifelong relationships with professors, work on publishable research, and have a couple of internships. I want to make great friends, become part of the equestrian club, and perhaps start a new club. I'd like to leave a mark, and when my time here is up, I know I will be prepared to get into a great medical school. It's a lot to ask of myself, but that's why UMBC is such a great fit. I'm confident I'll get the support and encouragement I need here. I'm looking forward to starting a new chapter and adventure in my life. Thank you. So before I give the reasons why I came to UMBC, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of context uh, as to my, how, how I was before I came. 
Um, so I was born in Kenya, Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya, in 1989, to James Wachero, who is a biology PhD student. Just from that, you can tell my PhD pursuit isn't that special. Um, and Phyllis Kariuki, who was a computer programmer. So um, we moved to uh, South Africa, 1995. And uh, after that, after my mother won the visa lottery, we came to America with nothing more than a dream and my dad's PhD. So um, when I first came, when we first came to uh, Maryland, um, I thought that I was going to be moving around uh, a bit more. Um, but it's been 13 years, and we're still here. So I have a feeling we'll be here a while more. Um, so while I was uh, growing up here in Baltimore, um, I had this itch for adventure. Um, it was partly because we had moved around so much before, but also because um, I always saw my dad going to conference trips, and he went to Luxembourg and Israel, and I was, I was here. Um, so when I graduated last year uh, with my bachelor's, I decided to go to Korea, South Korea, um, to teach English for a year. That turned out to be only six months. Um, it was six great months, but I felt constrained. I felt that intellectually and um, career-wise that I wasn't getting anywhere in my, uh, in my field. Um, instead of solving hard engineering problems, I was dealing with unru unruly students. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, by the way, kids are the same everywhere you go. <laughs> but um, so um, I, I decided, you know, I need to, I need to go back to grad school. Um, this, isn't, this isn't fun, um, and it's not going to get me anywhere. So while I was applying for grad school, I was looking at tuition, and that scared me. Um, and I was, I was wondering, you know, how was I gonna, gonna pay for this? I graduated, thankfully, with no debt from bachelor's. I saw that my colleagues who hadn't uh, graduated without debt were thinking about money in very um, negative terms. How much do I have to pay now? How much do I have to pay later? And so on. Um, thankfully, my advisor, Dr. Ma, Dr. Ma if uh, she's in the audience, um, she saved me. Um, she forwarded my application to the Meyerhoff Scholarship, uh, Meyerhoff Fellows Program. Um, supported me, which is going to support me for a year with funding. Um, it's for underrepresented um, students in the STEM fields uh, for medical-based research. Um, so I had that. That's great. So where am I going to live? Thankfully, my parents hadn't remodeled my room in the six months I was gone. <laughs> so so I, I basically just came back and moved with my parents. So um, I'm thankful to come back. Um, I, I have a great advisor. Um, I'm in a great fellowship program. Um, I love the people in my cohort, um, and I get to eat my mom's delicious food. <laughs> so thank you. That's what. Uh, that's why I came to UMBC. Tim, where did you go to undergrad school? Johns Hopkins University, a nice place, it really is. <laughs> it's now my privilege to introduce somebody who was the interim provost last year. He has been here for 22 years. Uh, he distinguished himself in many ways as a theoretical physicist, as president of the faculty senate, uh, as dean of science, and he is now our beloved provost, Philip Rouse. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you, Freeman. Um, first and most importantly, I want to start by personally thanking everyone here today for everything you have done and will continue to do to support our students by creating and nurturing the exceptional scholarly community that we call our UMBC. It is a representation of our ideals expressed in the integrity of our common purpose. I feel honored and privileged to find myself in this position as provost, but more than anything, I am really humbled by your trust and fellowship and the opportunity to work as one individual to help us all reach our common goals of excellence, discovery, compassion, diversity, and dignity. 
A few weeks ago, uh, somebody, and this is not an uncommon occurrence, by the way, a few weeks ago I was asked, uh, you know, what, what are you most proud of about UMBC and being provost and being associated with this community for such a long time? And, you know, I, I was inclined to, to, to follow up with the question, you know, how long have you got? Uh, because it probably uh, would even tax your patience if I was to, uh, uh, to mention all the ways in which I'm so proud of UMBC and, 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 and all of you. Um, but I did want to mention one. And um, it's particularly relevant to the last few years as we have faced some, uh, all of us face some fiscal challenges. Um, and this was an institutional priority that we held fast to. Um, it's the priority we have placed on making sure that people are able to keep their jobs and have jobs during this difficult time. Now, I refer to it as an institutional priority, but um, of course, really what this is, it's an expression of a community value and we also must acknowledge that every single person in our community and in this room today has made some sort of sacrifice so that this could happen and because of it UMBC could be a better place. So thank you. So I'm very fortunate to uh, have just returned for, from, a, uh, from spending three days in Iceland. And um, I learned that in Iceland they have a saying, um, and it's actually posed in the form of a question. And the question is, what do you do if you get lost in an Icelandic forest? And the answer is, you stand up. <laughs> <laughs> you understand why in Iceland it's gold and the trees are smaller than that one over there. Um, <laughs> it's British humor. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Freeman. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the career advice. Um, <laughs> and and um, that's uh, actually going to bring me, believe it or not, through a very circuitous route. Um, to speak about the next stage of the evolution of UMBC and the work we will all be engaged in over the next three or four years. Um, this is the next stage of our planning that will follow on from the strategic framework for 2016, which we originally put in place in the early 2000s. Now over the past two days, uh, the UMBC retreat focused on the process of planning and what we can learn by taking a look at uh, how UMBC has transformed itself over the past decade. Um, over the next year, we'll be reaching out across campus to fulfill our commitment to designing a planning process that involves the widest possible consultation and discussion among our community. Every one of us will have the opportunity to contribute, to contribute to decisions, and con to contribute towards our vision of UMBC and how we're going to get there. Um, it will, I suppose, coming back to my, uh, to my Iceland analogy, it will, I suppose, be a time where we will all stand up um, and think not only in terms of our immediate surroundings, but also thinking carefully about the overall vision and mission for our university, our part in it, um, and uh, how we get there. So I'm going to conclude, before we get to the final uh, uh, part of these remarks, I wanted to share with you, um, hopefully not too pretentiously, just a personal reflection with you about where we are at UMBC. And this is a sort of image I often have in my head when I think about it. Um, and it's this. Um, there's an open door in front of us. We are standing on the threshold that is the sum of our accomplishments. We have earned the right to establish for ourselves a new model for a modern public university, one that preserves our vision and our values. I know I speak for Freeman and myself in saying that we look forward to us all stepping through that door together. This year marks Freeman Rabowski's 20th year as president of UMBC.
convocation next week, uh, through homecoming, and throughout the whole year, we will be celebrating the incredible contributions that Freeman has made to our community, to our university, as, long, as well as the creativity and hard work of so many of you um, during the past two decades. So now, I would ask that you please retrieve your glasses from the center of the table. Um, if you've been very naughty and uh, taken a sip, uh, you should fill it up. Um, I'd like to point out that this is, of course, uh, UMVC vintage champagne. <laughs> It's 1966, of course. <laughs> and now I would like to ask everybody to please stand and join me. We all know that one individual alone cannot grow and transform a university, bringing it to the heights that UMBC has achieved. That takes the hard work and dedication of hundreds of people over many, many years. But one person can inspire and one person can lead. I propose a toast to Freeman, to our Freeman Rabowski, for his unwavering dedication to UMBC, outstanding leadership and remarkable vision over the last 20 years. Freeman, you truly inspire us all. To Freeman. Thank you so much, everybody. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to speak to us the State of University Address, Freeman. Absolutely amazing. This is going to be a, um, <clears throat> uh, an incredible year in so many ways. It really is. Uh, first of all, I was so touched by Gabriella and Tim's remarks. Give them both a hand, would you please? Very I will tell you that Philip is a, is a fascinating person with a postdoc from Cambridge and Berkeley and theoretical physics. And I remember one day we were talking and he said, Freeman, you know, it's interesting about Americans. They tend to think that when they hear someone with a British accent, <laughs> that that person is of privilege, comes from privilege. He said, far from the case. It was education that made the difference. And I was particularly touched by those words because it really is education that has transformed so many lives of people in this room and our families as we think about who we are. When I heard Tim say that he was born in 1989, the first thought I had was, believe it or not, was Bill Rosting, who came into my office in 1987 and said, now who are you? Wait a minute. <laughs> Give Bill Rosting a hand for coming in and said, who are you? <laughs> amazing. And so time continues to move on. It has been our tradition every fall to assemble and reconnect with one another, a very special part of being a community, and to highlight our progress and challenges. A year ago, I addressed our fiscal challenges and talked about how we had weathered the storm and gone through a lot of sacrifices and working through shared governance to make sure people had jobs and that people knew we, that we cared about them. I also highlighted many of the exciting ways in which we have been moving forward. This year, I'd like to focus on, again, maintaining our financial stability, not knowing what the future will hold, and how we will continue to move forward as we approach the 50th anniversary in 2016. I have often said that the first 50 years of our development really will create that foundation for the, for the future of this university. And so all of us, in many ways, are part of the founding group when people look back years from now. 
Above all, we have been true to the most important principles, protecting people, supporting people, and building the academic program. And we spent time over this past several days at the annual retreat focusing on just that, taking stock, looking at strategic planning, looking at what we've done with 2016 as a framework, which we began in 2006, 10 years ago, when amazingly one of our, our freshmen was in elementary school and our doctoral student may have been in middle school, somewhere in that time, how time passes. The two achievements this year that speak, I think, volumes about our core values have to do with our giving to others and how we think of ourselves. The first, for the fifth consecutive year, we have been awarded the Maryland Charity Campaign Governor's Cup for outstanding performance with a participation rate from faculty and staff exceeding all others. These are all of us who have given to help people we don't even know, but people who are in need. The average giving for the system of the University of Maryland is under 20%. This campus last year gave 70%, 70. Or give yourself a hand. Very impressive. Secondly, the Chronicle of Higher Education had its annual survey, and for the third year in a row, we were named one of America's great colleges to work for. Remember, the surveys go to all of you. They're anonymous. People can say whatever they want to say. We continue to be the only four-year campus in the state of Maryland where people say it's a great place to work. Let's give yourselves a hand for that. I've already congratulated our new provost. I want to congratulate our new dean of science, who was chair of chemistry. Bill, of course, give Bill a hand, would you please? He's a great guy. Is he here? He'll be here. There he is in the back. Thank you, Bill. They're doing a superb job. And then, uh, starting in 1973, we had this shining star, a young faculty member on this campus who has done so many things, from being president of the faculty, senate, dean of arts, humanities, and social sciences, of course, professor of history, a scholar, chair of the department, and he will be retiring at the end of this year. John Jeffries, wherever you are, give him a big hand, would you? Yeah, stand up, there, stand up. And we've made several key leadership appointments. And if you're here, I want you to stand. Charlene Yule is Director of the Budget and Resource Analysis. If Charlene is here, so I'm going to give Charlene a hand. Charlene, everybody knows her in Annapolis. She's really good. Wait a minute. And then I'm so proud of Simon Stacy, our Director of the Honors College. If he's here, if Simon is here, give him a hand. And Caroline Baker is now our Assistant VP for Careers and Corporate Partnerships. I'd say the jobs lady right there. Jess Myers is director of the Women's Center. Jess, wherever you are, over helping people out, give her a hand. Wherever she is. <laughs> and Cassie Bicky is director of the Learning Resources Center. Cassie, very proud of you. Very proud of you. And now I want you to take one moment to, for this final time, uh, recognize and celebrate the life of somebody who really represented the, the very spirit of UMBC our best, and that is my young brother Lamont Tolliver. Uh, he graced our campus for 22 years. He died suddenly this past February. Just a moment of silence as we think about the fact that we are better because of Lamont, a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to congratulate Keith Harmon. He's done a great job as acting director. Give Keith a hand if he's here. Keith Harmon, really doing a great job. Now I'd like to thank our, our Senate leaders. I'm going to ask them to stand, and then we'll give them a round of applause. They're all doing a great job. Tim Noe is president of the Faculty Senate. Carrie Sauter, president of the Professional Staff Senate. Dorothy Kaplan, president of the Non-Exempt Staff Senate. And our student leaders, SDA president Kylie Shramu, and then GSA grad president Doa Rashad. All of you stand, please. Leaders, wherever you are. Now, an overview of the budget. Despite the fiscal challenges, the system continues to do much better than most systems in our country. Uh, some of you heard Britt Curran talking the other day. For the first time in over four years, faculty and staff will receive a 2% COLA effective January 1. That COLA will be annualized and a part of everyone's base going forward. Uh, our FY 2013 budget totals about $370 million, which includes about an operating budget from the state of about $200 million, and the net increase is about $6 million over last year. 
Our, our strong enrollments, always remember, the strong enrollments will produce revenues. If we support students, students support us. And that modest tuition rate increase actually will result in about a $3 million increase to the state budget. The campuses, divisions, and colleges agreed to absorb a 1% base budget reduction, totaling about $1.25 million. You put it all together, and we were able to come up with $8 million to support new priorities. All of this you can see on the web, on the home page, when you go to look at the, the, the detailed uh, version of the speech. But early indications for FY 2014 uh, offer an interesting point of view. Chancellor Curran has said that uh, it looks as if, if the economy remains as stable as it is right now, and if you see the New York Times today, they talk about housing looking fairly reasonable. Uh, the fact is that we are planning for a 2.5% COLA for January 2014 and a 3% merit pool in April 2014. Let's hope that economy continues. If it doesn't, keep in mind that under the able leadership of your vice presidents and deans and, and Lynn Schaefer and others and the provost, we actually are in a position to make sure we're being very conservative because you never know what the economy is going to be. And so while we're hoping things will be better, if they are not better, we have come up with strategies we can use in an attempt to make sure we support people, keep people able to do their jobs, and to support our students. The fall enrollments looked really good. We're very proud of that. We've gotten so much national visibility from US News, from Princeton Review, from Kiplinger, from Personal Finance, even from 60 Minutes. And, and as a result, we are very healthy this fall. We'll have a student population that's at least 13,600 between four and 500 more than what we have right now. Freshman class will be the, the, the largest and best prepared ever, about 1,500 and 1,550 or so freshmen, uh, about 130 more than last year. Remember, we went down last year. We're back up this year and slightly ahead of last year with an SAT that's actually 20 points ahead of last year. The SAT for the average student is about 12, 26. That top group, of about 25 percent of the students you're talking in the 1400s just math and verbal for the average student all three parts 1800 all three parts about 2100 so a lot of students with 4.5s 35 40 uh, AP credits uh, it's a very impressive class a lot of valedictorians and salutatorians the grad student population about 2700 presidentially I'd say 3000 Dr. Rutledge somehow Approaching 3,000 is the way a president would talk about that, all right? But really, 2,700 graduate students. Uh, we continue to have students from 150 countries. Uh, the transfers numbers look very good at about 1,300. The residence halls are completely full, about 4,000, with three quarters of the freshmen living on campus. Uh, Dr. Young, we need more residence halls somewhere, wherever she is, all right? Uh -huh. So, and the graduation rate and retention rates continuing to go up. We're very pleased about that. Uh, we continue to use a variety of initiatives to help us with support our students. First year seminars, introduction to an honors university, the chemistry discovery center, CASEL, the retrieval learning center, the PhD completion project, the promise program, dissertation in the house. So at the undergrad and grad levels, we're constantly saying how do we do whatever we can to support our students. Some of you may recall that we really did learn that the more there is a sense of community among a group of students, uh, the more likely it is the student will have the kind of experience that will keep the student here. I want, I, I'm looking at Charlie Brown. The, the fact is that our athletes have higher graduation rates than anybody else on campus. Give them a hand for that, would you please? <laughs> mention them again in, in a minute, but a part of our success is in bringing in external money, so from the Howard Hughes Medical Institutions, NSF, NIH, the Gates Foundation, most recently the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and this new fund for academic innovation, where people will be competing for grants that would allow them to redesign courses across disciplines in the humanities, social sciences, and the arts, uh, in addition to the STEM areas. And as a result of that, we are seeing better and better performance on the part of students. We have two new programs that are fascinating to go with the other new programs that we've started in recent years, including one in management accounting and, and our first post back certificate program in music entrepreneurship. Fascinating area. You may want to look into that. Our continuing and professional studies division continues to play a really important part in working with our departments. Uh, if you've not had a chance to see some of the work they do over on South Campus or in five Maryland counties, I'll tell you the play. How many of you have been to the Columbia Gateway location? If you've not been, go see it. You'll feel really very, very impressed with UMBC. We are, we are educating hundreds of students in these places in cybersecurity and other areas, but it's a lovely location with a big picture of the library when you go in the building. It's yours. I mean, whether you, how many of you have been down to Shady Grove? 
Good, because, you know, we claim that, right? How many of you have been to the Columbia Center? Because we, we, we manage that. That's ours, too. Go down there and say, this is ours, all right? Go down. Just don't say it too loud, but it is ours, all right? <laughs> On a recent, uh, and I, I really want to congratulate the training centers, John Martello and all the others, because uh, for the second year in a row, Inc. Magazine named them to the fastest growing private companies in this special list. Uh, it's a real distinction. Give them a hand for that, would you please? <laughs> Some of you were here in this room when the governor came to announce that UMBC was launching the first four-year post-secondary education non-credit program for students with intellectual disabilities. Other states have done some work in this area. We are very proud to be the first. It's a partnership between the Maryland Department of Disabilities and our Shrivers Center. It's a pilot project, and the goal is to help Marylanders with intellectual disabilities to develop their independence, their problem-solving and employment skills uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Martello, Michelle Wolf, and others worked with them on that, and uh, it is, and we had a room filled with people with different types of disabilities who felt that people cared. And I thought it most appropriate that this campus would be one that would set the example for others. I have no doubt that our students and all of us will learn from these Marylanders. This is about the human experience. It's about all of us understanding the challenges that people face and how we work with them to overcome and to do the best they can with their lives. One other example of innovation is Breaking Ground. I'm really proud of that program, designed to link the campus's various civic engagement projects, uh, that have been developed over the past decade by student organizations. Uh, it's, it's seeking to help students, faculty, and staff to be agents of substantive change. And this past spring, the provost awarded uh, Breaking Ground grants for creating new courses or modifying courses that will allow us to focus on ways in which students can be involved in change. And interestingly enough, uh, organizations, student organizations and campus departments have been encouraged to apply for implementation grants focusing again on how we change the climate here on campus and beyond. You know, some of you will be at the convocation address and I will be telling freshmen about this special year. I want you to remember, this is a special year coming up in 1963. So many things happened, from, from good things to bad things, from tragedy of John Kennedy. Um, it is amazing to me that we can look back and say it has been 50 years since President Kennedy was killed. How many of you were not born in 1963? Wow. Kevin Eckert, we are the minority in the room. We're <laughs> it is amazing. You will hear me talking in convocation about, this was the beginning of my ninth grade year. I was a fat little nerdy kid. I was young. At this point, I was 11 turning 12, and I was young for the ninth grade. But I was, I was just a mad nerd. And it never occurred to me that before the year was out, I would be marching with Dr. King and find myself in jail. And when I think, and I'll talk about that to the freshmen, about how people at age 12 or 18 can make a difference in the world. And this is what Breaking Ground is doing. It's a fascinating attempt to make sure our students think through the difference they can make in the world. And now let me get to faculty and staff achievements. Uh, members of the faculty have distinguished themselves in many ways. These are just examples. We, we recognize this spring Terry Bowden in history for the Presidential Teaching Award and Tim Finan for the Presidential Research Award in Computer Science. Uh, also, Professor Bimal Sinha in Mathematics and Statistics received the Regents Faculty Award for Excellence in Research. And Professor Penny Reingans received the Regents Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentoring. And Professor Phyllis Robinson in Biological Sciences received the President's Commission for Women Achievement Award. A lot of other faculty, though, many other faculty. You're talking about hundreds of people getting awards. These are just examples. Mark Zupan uh, received the Fulbright and is now conducting research and teaching in Portugal. John Sturgeon in Visual Arts. A Fulbright is in London. Eric Dyer in visual arts, a Guggenheim, Ray Hoff, awarded the NASA's 2012 Distinguished Public Service Award. Ray Hoff has done so much for this campus. Ray, are you here? Give Ray Hoff, stand up Ray Hoff. I want to just, <laughs> he's done so much for this campus over the years. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Mike Hayden, the chair of physics, is, is, has been invited to participate in this Cottrell Scholars Collaborative Think Tank, very prestigious. Marie Desjardins in computer science was elected a distinguished scientist by the Association for Computing Machinery. And Rubin in history was elected president of the Society of Civil War Historians. Bruce Waltz in Emergency Health Services received a Lifetime Achievement Award from that national association. Raphael Falco in English was named the Lippitz Professor of the Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences. And then one final one, 
don't know whether she's here or not, but one of our faculty has been selected to be on leave to direct the International Tracing Service in Germany, serving victims of Nazi persecutions and their families by helping them determine the locations and fates of missing families. It's a major honor for her and for the university. Would you give Rebecca Bowling a hand, please? Is she here? Really? Really? We are so proud. So she's taking UMBC to Germany. We like that. This is good. <laughs> the several staff members also received incredible awards. Our Presidential Distinguished Staff Award winners include Paul Ciara in Physics, Cheryl Johnson in Contracting Grant Accounting, Arlene Unwall in International Education Services, Janet Magruder, Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture, uh, uh, receiving the Re Regent Staff Award for Outstanding Service, Michelle Wolf in the Shriver Center for the Jakubic Family Endowment Award, Lynn Wren received the National Association of the Kubo National Association for College and University Business Officers Rising Star Award, you get that? Lee Galizo received the American College Personnel Association Award with, uh, with its Women's Research and Scholarship Award, and then Jen Dress received the Outstanding Mid-Level Professional Award. Give, all of them stand and give them a hand, would you? <laughs> We, we are at $78 million in research grants this year. Just one great example with Claire Welty is that $2.6 million grant for the Center for Environment for Research and Education. She does amazing work. Uh, we got uh, almost a million dollars, 980000 from GE Healthcare to help with our Center for Advanced Sensor Technology. Uh, we had 600000 to the Center for Women in IT and Information Technology. Two big grants for $1.5 million uh, to the Maryland Institute for Policy Analysis and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And uh, uh, grants from NSF, NIH, Department of Education, the National Security Agency, and many others. And, uh, Talking about the English Language Center, the Center for History Education, the Imaging Research Center, the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture, the Charles Program, a range of grants across the board, across disciplines. And most recently, we've just heard and um, really want to thank both Rick and Alan for getting this grant from the National Science Foundation uh, concerning cybersecurity for $2.5 million from the National Science Foundation. Give them a hand for that. Rick Cornell and Alan Sherman. And then student achievements, we have students going, you name the university from Harvard to Hopkins to Stanford, uh, MD, PhDs to law school. Uh, I was really proud. I got a call from one of the, our mentees who was in Las Meninas, the, the actor, uh, Keelan Jones. He's just started at NYU, the Tisch School of the Arts. There were something like hundreds and hundreds of applicants. He beat out kids from the Yale Theater School. They only took 16. Give him a hand for that in the arts. It's really <laughs> I am encouraging you to look at our UMBC Review, the Journal of Undergraduate Research, and Bottleby, our Creative Arts Journal. Those undergraduates do an amazing job. Give them a hand for what they do with those journals. <laughs> and every week it seemed like somebody was telling me about a Fulbright student. So we've got students who are going to be teaching and studying in, in Laos, in Malaysia, in Spain, in Brazil, in Mexico, and the list goes on. And then we also had several students to get the White House internships, and two of our students actually were elected to the Board of Education in the Prince George's County school system. Very interesting. These are undergraduates, believe it or not. And then <laughs> six students received the NSF Graduate uh, Fellowships Award. Two of our students were among the very prestigious grad students, and these were undergrads who were invited to go to the Nobel Laureates meeting in Lindau, uh, Germany. Peter Agri has been uh, nominating students from this campus for some years, undergrad and grad, and every year we have students to go to that. And the idea is that these students who go may one day be Nobel Laureates. Gives me goosebumps to think about that. Uh, our Baja team in mechanical engineering finished third overall out of 253 teams in national competition. Big deal. Our chess team took second place in both the Pan American and in the Final Four of College Chess. Our ethics bowl team finished third in the Mid-Atlantic region. Now, let me tell you something I'm really proud of. Our athletes, our student athletes, overall 300 students, average GPA 3.0. Give them a really good <laughs> A couple examples of great seniors. If a women's volleyball standout, Iman Kennedy, who was from a rural town in North Carolina, came up, kept the 3.9, uh, amazing in psychology and biology. She actually she wanted to go to dental school, and 
young black woman had 99th percentile on the dental aptitude test. Amazing, at a 3.9. She could have gone anywhere. She wanted to go home. She's now at Chapel Hill. Everybody tried to get her. She wanted to go home, and I'm very proud of her. She was one of the 10 national finalists for the Arthur Ashe Sports Scholar Award. And then Curtis Schickner, uh, who was captain of the baseball team, graduated cum laude in economics. He's now working as an analyst for Exelon and uh, did amazing things representing all student athletes with the NCAA. Uh, big deal, big deal. Very proud of both of them. And finally, finally, very good news. Hot off the press, Charlie Brown. I want to congratulate Pete Karenji and his team. They just beat Rutgers, the Big East Conference champions in soccer two days ago. Give them a big hand for that. So we've just completed phase one of this new $160 million building, about the first half of the money. It, it is significant because it is a symbol of the importance of the arts and humanities on this campus. We're going to be using it to talk about the strength of research and teaching here uh, for arts, humanities, and social sciences. As John would say, it is an opportunity for us to really celebrate all of the good things going on in those areas. You'll be hearing a lot about that this year. Uh, I want to thank the governor and Maryland legislators and others for all they've done. We got the money for phase two. Give us a big hand for that. That's really, <laughs> really great. And it is amazing that one of our political science graduates, um, who is the speaker pro tem, Delegate Adrian Jones, amazing, did a superb job of helping us to move it ahead early. Give her a big hand for that, would you please? <laughs> John Jeffries, the chairs, the faculty, and I said yesterday, and our great campus architect, Joe Rexing, and all the physical facilities management people, give all of them a hand for making this a real success. <laughs> the words I've used from people going into the building are dazzling and stunning and, you know, light. And I think it was Jessica who said, we have light in all the offices. They were very pleased. And so when, if you, how many of you have gone into the building? Good. Get over there. Believe me, it just it elevates you. Just walking in, you, you'll, you, you'll get that feel. You really will. The campus's dramatic expansion is also seen in the research park. We now have eight buildings, 85 companies, hiring over 1,100 staff, over 130 students, uh, and things are going well there. We're very pleased about that. Great opportunities for economic development. And even as we have continued to expand the campus, we continue to think about environmental impact, uh, I signed the American College and University President's Climate Commitment five years ago, and that task force chaired by Lynn Schaefer and uh, economics professor Virginia McConnell. Uh, that committee has spearheaded our efforts to reduce greenhouse gases, and to date we've reduced the net carbon emissions by more than 11 percent. Give us a hand for that. <laughs> when I think about environment and, and the importance of it. There's a name that comes to mind, and I just want to just recognize it because she's always been talking about these things, bringing me pictures to see other campuses 20 years ago. Uh, Patricia Lanou is going to be retiring. Would you give her a big hand? She's done a superb job. Is she here? Is she here? She's done a superb job. Please, for sure. And then in terms of fundraising and friend raising, as Greg would say, uh, we, the endowment is now, again, above 60 million. Remember 20 years ago, it was not 1 million. It takes a lot of $500 to get a million dollars. You get my point? And money begets money. As we get up to that 100, it'll go on up to, so I want you to see an endowment of 200 million. Right. As Greg Simmons has a heart attack, as I say that, all right? <laughs> but it, it's going to continue to move. We've gotten great gifts this year, including major gifts from the Shermans and from Will Hackman and others. You'll be hearing about those. Uh, give the UMBC Magazine people a hand. Richard Byrne and the Law and all of them. It's amazing what they've done. They've continued to connect alumni to the place, and the more people know about us, the more they want to give. It's a good story. It really is. The, and the fact is, that um, we have more and more alums coming back, and they are impressed when they do. When Gabriella's dad comes back, I'm sure he looked very different from when he first came here, right? And it's a good thing. People take great pride in that. The, the Outstanding Alumni of the Year Awards will be held at Homecoming on October 11th. Homecoming is this fall between October 10th and 13th. We are, we are celebrating several people. Stephanie Hill, who was a 1986 graduate in computer science, now leads Lockheed Martin's information systems and global solutions business. Um, Greg, can, can Kangelosi, Kangelosi, <laughs> great, uh, and an English major, a successful technology entrepreneur, and Deborah Randall, uh, Randall in theater, is the founder and artistic director of the Venus Theater Play Shack. We'll be celebrating all three of them. 
And then in the IT area, uh, the division has done a superb job. It's significant that the auditors did not find one single finding or exception for that group. Give Jack Susan and his entire team a big round of applause. <laughs> You may not have thought about it, but it, the IT work involved with that new building, from installing and activating the campus network, preparing the computer labs, moving um, um, faculty offices, installing audio-visual systems and digital signage, all, as you can imagine, can take a lot of time. And because of the funding for the new building and the upgrading of the core network of the campus, we now have a campus data network that is state-of-the-art in American higher education, including upgrading our internet connection tenfold from one gigabyte to ten gigabytes. As a result, we are one of the most connected campuses in the country. Give all of them a hand for all of them. <laughs> As I get to the end, I have to say something about accountability because we're beginning a new year. We still go through audits all the time as we expand federal and state audits. And it's very, very important that we all take responsibility for being good stewards of these resources that the public gives us. As I frequently pointed out, external attention and investment require a consistently high degree of accountability and high standards because the regular scrutiny means we have to look at quality responsiveness, integrity, and accountability. In this past year, we had a number of audits, and it's very clear to the auditors that we take these matters very seriously. And management advisory services and the rest of you to be commended for going through the training and being very serious about auditing. Give yourselves a hand for being serious about auditing. It's very <laughs> As we go through building research to the next level, we have been working to really strengthen our compliance policies and procedures and our management systems as we think about making sure that as we grow, we can handle the money well, that we can be consistent in the processes that we use. And so as I conclude, over the years, putting first people, people first, is at the heart of our success. People know that we care about our students, we care about faculty and staff and that somehow, whether you've been here for five years or 10, you know you make a difference. How many of you have been here for five years or more? 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. Anybody 30 or more, stand up. Let me see what you look like. <laughs> Give them a hand. <laughs> you really do look good. That's the good news. The bad news is we're getting old, but that's okay. It's a, it beats the alternative, as somebody told me yesterday. All right. In just four years, 2016, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary, the Black and Gold's golden anniversary. Some would suggest in our country that conditions today are worse than they've been and that the future is not positive or rosy. Well, I would strongly disagree. In fact, I am more optimistic than ever. I am inspired by the, the leadership of FDR during the Great Depression in the 1930s when so many people said the country was going down the tubes, that it would never come back to be what it had been. And yet, President Roosevelt responded with great optimism because he had faith in the resilience and the capacity of the American people to work hard to care about other people and to believe in themselves. It's that same optimism that this campus shows every day. And so I close with words from FDR's 1937 inaugural address, words that give me goosebumps. He said this from a wheelchair. I see millions denied education and the opportunity to better their lot and the lot of their children I see one-third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. But it's not in despair that I paint you that picture. I paint it for you in hope. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. It is an honor every day to be president of UMBC. Thank you all very much.
everyone to remain for the singing of the alma mater. So please stand.